Introduction to Experimental Design There are two basic types of statistical research studies. An observational study, which includes sample surveys and case-controlled studies, and an experiment. Let's define what an observational study means. An observational study, as its name suggests, observes individuals and measures variables of interest, but no treatments are assigned to the subjects or experimental units by the researcher. Researchers use a variety of terms to describe who exactly is being measured. The generic term unit is used to indicate a single individual or object being measured. When the units are people, they are usually called subjects or participants. We'll look at a specific example from the 1999 AP Statistics exam. The dentist in a dental clinic would like to determine if there is a difference between the number of new cavities in people who eat an apple a day and in people who eat less than one apple a week. They are going to conduct a study with 50 people in each group. 50 clinic patients who report that they routinely eat an apple a day and 50 clinic patients who report that they eat less than one apple a week will be identified. The dentist will examine the patients and their records to determine the number of new cavities the patients have had over the past two years. They will then compare the number of cavities in the two groups. Why is this an observational study? This was an observational study because the dentist and the clinic are only observing the apple eating behavior of the participants and recording the number of new cavities. They are not imposing any treatment. Let's look at identifying variables. Regardless of the type of study we wish to conduct, an observational study or an experiment, it's useful to assign generic names to the variables of interest. The explanatory variable. That's the variable whose effect you want to study. The one that you think might be causing the differences you see in the response variable. So obviously our response variable is the variable that you ex expect is being affected by or changed by the explanatory variable. So let's look back at our um, example problem and can you identify the explanatory and response variables in the dental clinic study? So you might want to pause a second to think about that. The explanatory variable, apple eating frequency, either eating an apple a day or less than one apple a week. The response variable is the number of new cavities. So even if this dental study reveals that the patients in the group who routinely eat an apple a day have significantly fewer new cavities than the patients in the group who eat less than one apple a week, they cannot assign a causal relationship between the explanatory variable, the apple eating frequency, and the response variable, the number of new cavities. Let's think about why not. Can you suggest another reason, other than eating an apple a day, that might explain why the dental patients in the apple a day group had fewer new cavities than the dental patients in the group that ate less than one apple a week? So pause the video and think about that a moment. So this brings us to our discussion of confounding variables. A confounding variable is a variable that both affects the response variable and is also related to the explanatory variable. Confounding can lead to invalid conclusions because the effect of the confounding variable on the response variable cannot be separated from the explanatory variable's effect on the response variable. We'll look at that in detail in a moment. The term lurking variable is sometimes used to describe a potential confounding variable that has not been taken into account in the design of the study. The two groups, subjects who ate an apple a day and those who ate less than one apple a week, might differ in more ways that affect the number of new cavities than just the explanatory variable, the apple eating frequency, when confounding is present, and so we would not be able to separate out those effects. So if you're asked to explain the concept of confounding in the context of the study and include an example of, possible, of a possible confounding variable. So again, you might want to pause the video and think about that before you listen to the answer. People who eat an apple a day may also eat fewer sugary foods, which would also contribute to fewer cavities. We would not be able to separate out the effect on the reduction in cavities resulting from eating an apple a day and the reduction in cavities from eating fewer sugary foods. Eating fewer sugary foods is a confounding variable because we can't separate out its effect on the response variable, the number of new cavities. So let's talk about the explanatory variable, the thing that we think is explaining, 
and the response variable, the effect. So we would like to be able to say that eating an apple a day causes the effect of fewer cavities. But we know that eating fewer sugary foods could also be an attribute that people that eat an apple a day have. So they'd also be likely to be in the eating an apple a day group and that also could lead to fewer cavities. We could think of other things too. People that eat an apple a day might also have better dental hygiene and better dental hygiene could also lead to fewer cavities. If you're asked to identify a possible confounding variable, you must state the possible confounding variable, show how subjects in the treatment group are also likely to be in the confounding variable group. So before I said that people who uh, eat an apple a day may also eat fewer sugary snacks. So our patients who eat an apple a day, there are subjects, might also eat fewer sugary snacks. So the fewer sugary snacks is the confounding variable. And you must show the possible confounding variable would also cause a change in, re in your response variable. And you need to state the direction of that possible change. And so you could say, and that could also be what's causing a decrease in the number of fewer cavities for these patients. So the number of new cavities is the response variable, and we've indicated the direction of it, the decrease. The key to identifying a possible confounding variable is to explain how it is linked to both the explanatory variable and the response variable in a way that also explains the observed association that you're seeing. Now what if the mean number of new cavities for those who ate an apple a day was statistically significantly smaller than the mean number of new cavities for those who ate less than one apple a week? Could one conclude that the lower number of new cavities can be attributed to eating an apple a day? explain. No, a cause and effect relationship cannot be concluded from an observational study, only from a controlled randomized experiment. Both explanations, eating an apple a day and eating fewer sugary snacks, are consistent with a reduction in cavities. In this study, we have no way of separating out the effects of eating an apple a day from the effects of eating fewer sugary snacks on our response variable, number of new cavities. We may say that eating an apple a day is associated with fewer new cavities, but we cannot say that eating an apple a day causes fewer new cavities. Now, let's pause a second here. Don't get the idea that observational studies are useless. It is sometimes impossible or even unethical to conduct a randomized experiment. Consider the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. Numerous studies over the years have shown a strong association between smoking and lung cancer. It would be unethical to conduct an experiment in which one group of volunteers was instructed to smoke a certain number of cigarettes each day and another group instructed to refrain from smoking. Many case-controlled studies con conducted to determine the relationship between smoking and lung cancer have led to increased awareness of the harmfulness of smoking in addition to restrictions on sales of tobacco products to minors. In a case-controlled study, case subjects and controls should differ only with respect to disease status and exposure to the agent under investigation. In the 1920s, healthcare workers in Great Britain first began to suspect a relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. The suspicion was based on the fact that many patients who acquired lung cancer were also smokers. Although this was an astute observation, these workers lacked the sci scientific evidence to justify their position. As a result, between 1930 and 1960, numerous epidemiologic studies were undertaken to try to quantify that relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Two of these studies, one in 1947 by Sir Richard Dahl and one in 1951 by A.B. Hill, are considered classics. Dahl uses the case-controlled study method, and he compared the smoking history of a group of hospitalized patients with lung cancer with the smoking history of a similar group without lung cancer. Hill used a cohort study, categorizing a group of British physicians according to their smoking histories and then analyzing the causes of death among those who died to see whether cigarette smokers had a higher incidence of lung cancer. So I hope you get the idea that association does not imply causation. But sometimes it can give us a pretty big hint that a re relationship truly does exist. We saw that in the previous observational study, we couldn't make reliable inferences about whether or not eating an apple a day caused a reduction in new cavities, but because the two groups, the patients who ate an apple a day and those who ate less than one apple per week, 
were different in ways that could affect what we were trying to measure, which was new cavities, in some way other than apple eating frequency. A randomized experiment will come to the rescue. Randomized experiments are designed to help control for the influence of confounding variables. In a randomized experiment, subjects are randomly assigned to the treatments. So what does random assignment to the treatments achieve? Randomization to a treatment groups helps to create groups that are as similar as possible in ways that might affect what we're trying to measure, the response variable. So the groups should be as similar as possible before any treatment is imposed. If there is a difference in the responses to the treatments, then the difference that we observed were caused by either chance, the randomization process, or the treatment. If the differences observed are too great to plausibly be attributed to chance alone, then we may conclude that the results are statistically significant and we can infer that the cause of the difference in the responses was due to the treatment opposed. So we've said a cause and effect relationship. Randomly assigning experimental units or subjects to the different treatment groups tends to balance out all the other variables between the groups. Any variables that could have an effect on the response should be equalized between the groups and therefore should not be confounding. If an observed difference in the groups is too large to be expected to happen by the random chance inherent in, random, in the random assignment process, then a plausible explanation for the observed differences is the treatment received, and we can assign a cause and effect relationship between the explanatory and response variables. Now I'd like to take a moment to talk about the differing goals of randomization in random sampling versus an experiment. In random sampling, our goal, the goal of random sampling, is to learn something about some aspect of our population based on a representative sample from it. In random assignment, our goal, the goal of an experiment is to be able to attribute a cause and effect relationship when a relationship actually does exist between our explanatory and response variables. So how do we re achieve our goal in random sampling? We achieve it by random selection from the population we are interested in making an inference about. By random sampling, we ensure that our sample is representative of the larger population with respect to the question we are trying to answer. How do we achieve our goal in an experiment? Random assignment to treatments so that any variables that we didn't control for in the design of the experiment should affect each group about the same. Now let's talk about designing an experiment. In a previous video, Introduction to Sampling, you were shown how to collect data in a way that would allow you to generalize or infer from a sample to a larger population. In an experiment, our goal is to assign a cause and effect relationship between the explanatory variable and the response variable by comparing two or more treatments randomly assigned to the experimental units. We already looked at the role randomization plays in an experiment. In order to determine whether or not our treatment had an effect on the response variable we are measuring, we need to know what would have happened to the response variable if the treatment had not been applied. To do this, experimenters create control groups, which are treated identically in all respects except for the treatment received. A control group may receive a standard or existing treatment that is compared to a new drug, or they may receive a placebo, a drug that looks like the treatment but has no active ingredients. Comparison of two or more treatments is the simplest form of control. Let's talk about replication. The more subjects that are used in an experiment, the more likely that randomization will create groups that are alike on average. Then when differences are averaged out, only the effects of the different treatments or random chance as a result of chance assignment remain. So the principles of experimental design. Control the effects of lurking variables on the response variable, most simply by comparing several treatments. Randomization, so the use of randomization to the different groups takes away any sort of bias and impersonal chances used to assign the subjects to the treatments and replication of the experiment. So to summarize, a well-designed experiment must have both random assignment of experimental units to treatments and a controller comparison group that is compared to the group receiving the treatment of interest. Replication is the random assignment of the same treatment to different experimental units. Each treatment is randomized to enough experimental units to provide an adequate assessment of how much the responses from the same treatment vary. When these key elements are present, the experiment is called a randomized comparative experiment. Controlling for hidden bias, so the difference between a blind and a double-blind experiment. 
In order for the control and treatment groups to be treated exactly the same, except for the treatment they receive, both the subjects and the person administering the treatment should be blind. In a blind experiment, the subject does not know which treatment they are receiving. In a double-blind experiment, neither the subject or the person administering the treatment has knowledge of which treatment the subject received. In a double-blind experiment, the treatments are typically coded with a number that only the researcher analyzing the final results knows the answer to, the code at, at which group was assigned to which treatment. So let's talk about designing a completely randomized experiment by starting with an example. So here's the experiment we'd like to design. Menopause is when a woman's menstrual period stops permanently. Some women experience hot flashes, night sweats, and related problems such as poor sleep and irritability as a result of menopause. Menopausal hormone therapy, called MHT, has been used to treat menopausal symptoms, but it does come with a risk of side effects. Researchers would like to test the effect of a natural estrogen supplement on reducing menopausal symptoms. Fifty menopausal women have volunteered to take part in the study. They will be asked to rate the severity of their symptoms on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being very low symptoms, 10 being severe symptoms, prior to the experiment, and then again 8 weeks after treatment. Your goal is to design a completely randomized experiment to compare the difference in mean reduction in menopausal symptoms in menopausal women who take MHT versus those who take a natural estrogen supplement. So let's talk about how to achieve that. Sometimes it's helpful to start with a diagram just to summarize the key components for yourself. So the key components of a controlled randomized experiment. All right, so let's look at this grid. So we start with random assignment of the subjects to the treatment group. So we started with 50 menopausal women. They pre-rated their severity symptoms. We randomly assign them. Now we need to identify the treatment groups. So the treatment groups are the group getting MHT and the group getting the natural estrogen supplement. And then we compare the responses, always in context. You must show you know what the response variable is. Now a diagram alone isn't sufficient, but it does help us to sort of collect and gather our thoughts. So a little paragraph on that. I would say each of the women will be asked to rate their menopausal symptoms on a scale of 1 to 10 prior to the start of the experiment. Half of the women will be randomly assigned to receive MHT and the other half to receive the natural estrogen supplement. At the conclusion of the eight-week study, the women will again rate their menopausal symptoms. The difference in mean menopausal symptoms, post minus pre, for the MHT group and the natural estrogen group will be compared. A diagram is not necessary in the design of your experiment, but it can help you organize the components of a well-designed experiment. You do not need to explain the randomization technique that you will use unless specifically asked. This is often a Part B follow-up question on the exam. You may want to review the different ways to choose a random sample by going back and reviewing the Introduction to Sampling video. Designing experiments to reduce variability. Well, there's good variability because that reveals the differences between the treatments, but there's also bad variability which obscures differences between treatments. In order to conclude that the treatment makes a difference, the difference between the treatments has to be large enough to overshadow the variation within each treatment. A well-designed experiment should control for as much within treatment variability as possible in the actual design of the experiment. So let's talk about a block design. In a block design, experimental units or subjects who are similar with respect to the variable being measured are grouped to form a block. For blocking to be effective, the anticipated variability among the experimental units or subjects within the same block should be less than the anticipated variability among the experimental units in different blocks. In other words, individuals in a block should be as homogeneous or similar as possible with respect to what we are measuring, and different blocks should be different with respect to the response variable. So let's talk about the menopausal symptoms study. So recall in the previous experiment, researchers wanted to test the effect of the natural estrogen supplement on reducing menopausal symptoms. So suppose researchers have reason to believe that women who begin menopause naturally as a result of aging will react differently to supplements used to reduce menopausal symptoms than women who began menopause as a result of having a surgery called a hysterectomy. A well-designed experiment controls for as much anticipated variability as possible in its design. 
Because we believe these two groups will respond differently to treatments to reduce menopausal symptoms, we should block on whether or not a menopausal woman has had a hysterectomy. We would then conduct parallel experiments on each block. So suppose the 50 women that volunteered who, to take part in the study, suppose 30 of them began menopause naturally and 20 began, began menopause as a result of having a hysterectomy. Let's look at a block design. So we start with our subjects, the 50 menopausal women. We have them rate the severity of their symptoms and then we block by how their menopause began, either naturally, by age, or by having a hysterectomy. So each of the women will be asked to rate their menopausal symptoms. A block design will be used. Women who began menopause naturally as a result of age will be put in one block and women who began menopause as a result of a hysterectomy will be put in a separate block. In each block, half of the women will be randomly assigned to receive the MHT and the other half to receive the natural estrogen supplement. At the conclusion of the eight-week study, the women will again rate their menopausal symptoms. The difference in the mean menopausal symptom post minus pre for the MHT group and the natural estrogen group will be compared for both the women who uh, entered menopause naturally and for the women who entered menopause by the result of a hysterectomy. Blocking is used to control the factors you can see. Randomization helps balance the ones you cannot see. So in summary, in the words of our esteemed Dick Schaefer, the first chief reader for the AP statistics exam, so, so block for what you can, any anticipated variability in the response variable, and randomization to create groups that are as similar as possible to help balance out the effects that we couldn't. Now I'd like to talk about a special form of blocking called a match pairs design. There are two types of match pairs designs, one that compares just two treatments, each block consists of two units or subjects who are as closely matched as possible. You anticipate them to have similar responses to any treatment. Then I randomly assign each subject in the pair one of the treatments. An alternate form is where each subject receives both treatments and the order of the treatments is randomized. So suppose we ask the question, is there a difference in a person's standing, sitting and standing pulse rates? So an AP statistics class hypothesized that on average a person's standing pulse rate would be higher than his or her sitting pulse rate. To investigate this, when the students entered the classroom, they were randomly assigned a slip of paper by the teacher. Half the papers had sit on them and half had stand. The students who had a slip of paper with stand on it were asked to stand without leaning on the desk or chair and the sitting group was told to sit comfortably. Both groups were asked to record their pulse when the signal was given. The student's pulse rates and the position, sit or stand, were recorded. Next, the roles were reversed. The students who were sitting recorded their pulse rate standing and vice versa. Dot plots of the sitting and standing pulse rates were constructed and analyzed. So the top dot plot shows the, times, uh, pulse, the pulse rate times for students when they were sitting and the bottom when they were standing. Although the distribution of standing pulse rate times appears to be shifted to the right of the sitting times, there's a lot of overlap in the two distributions, so it's really not clear that overall the standing mean would be higher. Further analysis of the data revealed that uh, Alyssa has a relatively low pulse rate as compared to her classmates both when sitting and when standing. And Julianne had a relatively high pulse rate as compared to her classmates both when sitting and when standing. A well-designed experiment co should control for as much within treatment variability as possible in the design of the experiment. The class discussed using a block design. Some suggested blocks to control for variability were blocked by whether the person was an athlete or a non-athlete. One group suggested three blocks, athlete in season, athlete not in season, and not athlete. And one group suggested blocking on gender. Although each of the proposed block designs will probably control for some of the anticipated variability in pulse rates, the class decided that a match pairs design would control for the most anticipated variability in students' pulse rates. Each student will receive both treatments, pulse rate while sitting and pulse rate while standing, and the order of the treatments would be randomly determined. So here's a grid of a match pairs design. Each student will take his or her pulse rate both when sitting and standing. The order to sit or stand will be randomly assigned. The difference in mean pulse rate standing minus sitting will be analyzed. 
The top dot plot is the graph of the individual difference, differences in pulse rates, standing minus sitting, for each student in the class. We can see that one student had a sitting and standing pulse rate that was the same, was the, same the difference equals zero. But the rest of the students had standing pulse rates that were higher than their sitting pulse rates. The differences were positive. The match pairs design controlled for the person-to-person -person variability in pulse rates, making it clear that their pulse rates tend to be higher when, when standing rather than when sitting. So if you compare the, the top dot plot, the distribution of the differences in pulse rates, it's pretty clear that standing results on average in higher pulse rates, whereas in the bottom, it was really hard to tell because there was so much overlap in the two groups. So the class data was entered into StatKey, and a simulated sampling distribution of the difference in pulse rate, stand minus sit, when any effective position in which the pulse rate was taken was removed by randomly shuffling the student's pulse rates and assigning half of the pulse rate values to the sit group and the other half randomly to the stand group. Then the differences stand minus sit were recorded and the mean calculated. This simulation was then repeated for a total of 1,000 trials. So if we look at this, we notice that for our group in class, the mean difference was 10 beats per minute. And if you look at the, the graph here, uh, in none of our um, trials was there a simulation, simulated mean as high as 10 beats per minute or higher. Let's now talk about scope of inference. In an observational study, if the data can be considered representative of the population, with, re with regard to the question of interest, then inference from the sample to the population can be drawn. We may say the variables are associated, but no cause and effect relationship can be attributed. In an experiment, if the experimental units are randomly selected from the population of interest and randomly assigned to the treatments, then inferences to the population can be drawn and a cause and effect relationship can be established between the explanatory and response variables. But, and this is a big one, most randomized experiments use volunteers. So whether or not inferences can be drawn to some larger population depends on how representative the units or subjects are of some larger group. A cause and effect relationship can be established between the explanatory and response variables. Technically, if the experimental units are not randomly selected from the population, we can say we can attribute a cause and effect relationship but any inference is limited to only the experimental units included in the actual study. Now this is very limiting, and in reality, researchers try to justify a larger population that the experimental units are likely representative of in order to broaden the scope of inference of their experiment. Observational study versus an experiment. An experiment requires a treatment, a control group, random assignment to the treatments, and replication multiple subjects and a protocol that could be replicated by another researcher. If any of these are lacking, then you don't have an experiment, merely an observational study. In an experiment, researchers manipulate something and measure the effect of the manipulation on some outcome of interest. Randomized experiments are experiments in which the participants are randomly assigned to participate in one condition or another. The different conditions are called the treatments. Cause and effect. In an observational study, you can show an association between the explanatory variables, the explanatory and response variable. Only, only, only in an experiment can you attribute a causal relationship between the explanatory and response variables. Even if you can attribute a causal relationship between the explanatory and response variables, you should be very mindful of your scope of interest. This ends our video on experimental design. Thanks for taking part.